Welcome to First Baptist Church. You're listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead. Please check us out on the internet at fbcboron.org. Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. <clears throat> and the word of the sovereign Lord reads... This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. This is the word of the Lord. The late John Stott says this, the authority by which the Christian leader leads is not power, but love. Not force, but example. Not coercion, but reasoned persuasion. Leaders have power, but power is safe only in the hands of those who humble themselves to serve. As we said last week, I will repeat, the simple truth is this. The world needs the church. And the reason why the world needs the church is because the world needs Jesus. More than anything else, the world needs Christ. The world needs Christ more than money, even though that the world will tell you differently. More than peace. More than security, though we all seem to be longing for security. Even now, the first memes that pop up on the internet are World War III memes because we're afraid of what's going to happen next. More than freedom. And Brother Asif is not free to the extent that we are. We need Jesus more than medicine, though there are many that we know that are suffering. Even more than acceptance, we need Christ. What the world needs more than anything else is to be rescued from the sin and the power of sin and the coming wrath of God against mankind because of that sin. Because the greatest problem that all of mankind faces is the fact that God is good and we are or not good. That's the greatest problem we face. And because God is good, he must sh make sure that justice is done against all who rebel against him, which, by the way, is everyone. Which means that every person, regardless of how wonderful their life is, regardless of how smart they are, regardless of what they accomplish, regardless of how loving they are, regardless of how much money they make in their life, every person will one day stand before this holy and righteous God and he will pronounce judgment upon them because of their sin. And every single one of them will be found guilty because why? They are. And all of those who die in their sins without Christ will face an eternity that's infinitely worse than all the worst things that they've ever experienced in their life combined as the just and righteous punishment for the re their rebellion against God. You see, what the world needs is to be washed clean from their sin. The world needs to be made right with God. And praise the Lord that he made a way for that to happen. Praise the Lord that he loved us enough to make a way for us that we were not hopeless to be this way forever. We can be washed clean. We can be made righteous, but only through one way, and that is available through Jesus Christ and him alone. He is the one who shed his blood to wash us clean of our sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He shed his blood to wash away our sin. He lived a perfect life that we couldn't live so that he can then clothe us in his righteousness so that we can now have fellowship with God again. That's what the world needs. The world needs Jesus, which means the world needs the church because the church the church is God's instrument that he has ordained and is using to bring the hope of Christ to the rest of the world. And that is where we begin this, this, uh, this three-part series that we're in. 
by clearly establishing the fact that the way in which God is bringing the hope of Christ to his people around the world is not simply by renegades and individuals, but by the unified body of believers, the church. The church is God's family declaring and defending the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church is the family of God and his instrument that he's using to protect and to proclaim the gospel. God's plan to save his people is indeed the church. And as we talked about last week, if the church is going to be that and be able to do the things that God is calling them to do, then there are three foundational things that the church, without question, must get right. The church must get right what the truth is. We must be able to stand firmly in what the truth is. Secondly, we have to get the leadership of the church right. And thirdly, we must get the membership of the church right. And last week we talked about that truth. That if the church is going to survive, if the church is going to be effective, if the church is going to, to be the church, it must absolutely get the truth completely right. Because without the truth... Hear me, without the truth, we don't have a church, we have a club. Without the objective, God-given standard for truth, the church is simply lost in a sea of relativism. And so we, as we talked about, is the, the fact that the truth of the church is ultimately rooted in and founded upon the Word of God, the Scriptures. The Bible, as we said over and over again, is what? Theanustos. It is, it is the breath of God. It is God's word. And because it's the word of God, it is authoritative for all of life, for our faith, and how we practice our faith. It is our final authority. Tradition is not our final authority. The word of God is our final authority. It is the standard of truth by which we measure everything else. It is the standard of truth by which we compare everything else. And because the Bible is the Word of God, then we know for a fact that it's inerrant, infallible, and it's sufficient. The Bible is without error. It is unfailing in what it means to accomplish. And it's sufficient enough to bring the truth of God to the rest of the world and His plan of redemption. That is the truth that we must stand on. That is the truth that we must hold on to. That, that, that it is the very Word of God. The Bible is the foundation of the truth. And on that we build then our church doctrines or the teachings of the church. Biblical doctrines is biblical doctrine is the clear teaching of the truths that we find in the scriptures. It's how we communicate these truths to one another. <clears throat> and if the church is to survive very long, if the church is to fulfill the mission that Christ is calling us to be, it must hold to and teach orthodox biblical doctrines of the faith as handed down to us by the apostles and by the church. Our doctrines help us to teach clearly what the Bible says about important subjects like who God is and who man is and who he is in light of who God is. Doctrine, it teaches us about salvation and the Trinity and about sin and the scriptures themselves. Our doctrine helps us to clearly teach the truth of what the Bible itself contains. And then our confession or our creeds or our statement of faith help us to declare what it is we believe. You see, the foundation for truth is the Bible. Doctrine, then, is the teaching of the truth. And confession is the way we declare what we believe about the truth. And our confession, as we talked about last week, is a dividing line between true doctrine and false doctrine. Our confession of faith is the dividing line between true believers and unbelievers. Because unbelievers will not confess the truth. It divides between true churches and, and cults. Our confession gives us clear boundaries of what is true and what is false. And as such, it helps us to protect the church. And so if the church is going to be what God is calling it to be, we must absolutely get right the truth, which is what we talked about last week. Now, next week, the one week coming, we're going to spend some time talking about membership in the church. What does it mean to be a member of of a church from a biblical perspective. We're going to talk about membership and why it's important and why we need to get that right. But this week, we're going to focus on the leadership of the church. We're going to talk about and really examine what church leadership is. And we're going to talk about why it's important to get that right. You see, when we read in the New Testament 
One of the issues that we see popping up repeatedly from the very beginning is the failure of church leadership to protect the word of God, and there ends up being a rise of false teachers in, that lead people astray. If you're familiar with the, the, the letter to the Galatians, what you'll realize is the letter to Galatians was written because the leaders of that church allowed false teaching to take root in the church, and it actually overthrew the gospel. The Galatians began to believe that, that salvation isn't simply by faith in Christ, but now I have to become a Jew as well. They begin to believe that faith wasn't enough, that you had to now begin to, to uphold the Jewish law. This is a failure of the church leadership and it led people astray. It's the same thing with, with the church of Ephesus. Paul sent Timothy to Ephesus for a clear reason, to fix the church there, because the church had ordained and put into power unqualified leaders who then as a result began to teach false teachings and false doctrines, and the church fell into grievous error. And as a result, the members of the church begin to embrace false teachings and begin to live in these false teachings and were living in error, and this reflected in every part of their lives. We see this issue throughout the New Testament. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Beloved, do, you not, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. False prophets are everywhere. And how do you test the spirit's? By the word God. Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, he says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, you will, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 and 15, through 15, for such men are false prophets, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, so it is no surprise his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Jude says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were destined for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Even Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Church leadership and getting that right has been an important issue from the beginning of the church. It is a foundational thing. And what we need to understand is when, we, when the church fails to get the leadership of the church right, everything else falls apart. Everything else falls apart. If the church fails to get the leadership right, and it will soon then right, get the, it will fail to get the, the truth right. If the church fails to establish biblical leadership, the truth follows with it very soon. And then right after that becomes the membership of the church. These things are interconnected, by the way. Each one of them influences the other. They are all three foundationally important. If the church fails to put into place qualified biblical leadership, the church will fail to get the truth right and fall into deep, grave error. And this leads people away from the life-saving truth of the gospel. And we see it around us all the time. We see what was once thought to be orthodox teachings of people on television to find out that they're leading people astray into grievous error. Like, for instance, Bethel Church up north. They had this view. The wor one of the, the worship team members lost their daughter at two years old. My heart breaks for them. My heart weeps for them. But they had a, an ongoing worship service praying that God would resurrect the baby. Right? We, don't, we understand that the resurrection is coming, but the resurrection is not going to happen now. Right? And, and they were working people up into a tizzy, and they were singing, and they were just crying out to, for this girl to come out of the grave. And, and this is what happens, right? What, what, what a destructive, you know, heart-wrenching theology when your hope isn't in what God's plan is for the future. Right? And, and there's more and more and more examples of that all around us. If the church fails to put in place qualified leadership, they will fail to get the, the, the church right. And this is the, this is the warning of Scripture over and over again. And so just as the church must have a clear handle on the truth, it must have a clear handle on leadership. 
And with that then, let's ask the question of what church leadership really is. And the truth is, there's a lot of different ways to lead in the church. There's lots of different ways to lead in the church. You see, leadership in the church is not just simply reserved for a select few people, as many people might assume. Leadership is not simply the pastor or the deacons or the children's director. Leadership is something that's even greater than that. There are many ways and capacities to lead in the church, and the reason for that is because there are many ways to serve in the church. Because biblical leadership ultimately is service. Church leadership is about service. And how do we know that? Because that's the example that, that Jesus Christ himself left for us. He is the leader of the entire church. He, there is no greater or higher leader than he. And what does he say? He said in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life for a ransom for many. John Stott, the theologian, that's, by the way, a name I would really encourage you to become familiar with. If you ever get a chance to hear some of his preaching on audio or read any of his books, John Stott was a British theologian, brilliant mind, somebody that you can learn a lot from. He said this, the authority by which the Christian leader leads is not power, but love. Not force, but, but example. Not coercion, but reasoned persuasion. Leaders have power, but power is safe only in the hands of those who humble themselves to what? To serve. Leadership in the church is that. It is about service. And so what that means is there's lots of ways to lead in the church because there's lots of ways to serve. Whether you're mowing the grass, whether you're changing diapers in, in the, the nursery, whether you're, you're teaching children or singing on the worship team, whether you're passing out the elements for the Lord table, or counting the offering, or distributing the foods in a blessing box, leading a Bible study, you know, discipling your children, or even preaching on Sunday. All of those things are leadership in the church. <coughs> because all of those things are leadership roles. Because they are service. That's why we insist that those who, who serve here do so in accordance with the Word of God. That we don't serve you know, according to our own whims, but what God has to say. And we also insist that those who serve do so as members of the church who confess our statement of faith because service is ultimately leadership. If there's anything that you remember today, that would be the one thing I would hope that you would remember. <coughs> service is leadership. And all leaders ultimately serve. But with that, there is a God-ordained order to leadership in the church. Just like in the family, God has ordained specific roles for specific types of people, and that is what I want to focus on today because this is the most critical part of church leadership. This is the part we need to get right. And in the Bible, the, the scriptures spell out for us really two essential leadership positions in the church. There are lots of ways to lead, but there are two specific leadership roles in the church that the Bible talks about and they are deacons, and they are elders. <clears throat> deacons and elders. Let's first start by talking about deacons. Being a Baptist, I think that we are probably very familiar with the word deacons. It's one of those words we throw out around a lot. Deacons are simply the leading servants in the church. In fact, <clears throat> that is what the word deacon means. It, it means servant. The English word that we use to, in the scriptures to derive, that we derive from the Greek word, comes from the Greek word dikonos, which in essence means waiter. That's what it means. It's a word that's really loaded with a sense of deep service. It's a, it's a, a word that's com of committed service. It's basically someone on a mission to serve. In fact, even more specifically than that, dikonos is made up of two different words. You have dia, which means thoroughly or completely, and conus, which is dust. Now, I know that sounds weird, but here's the idea when you put the words together. It's the idea that, if someone, that, that someone is thoroughly raising up dust by moving around in a hurry. You see, it's a word picture. It's this idea that someone is so busy and so energetically engaged in service that they're creating a dust trail everywhere they go. 
Right? It's a picture of someone hustling to get things done. It's the, it's the idea that someone is, is completely engaged and energetically serving. Right? That's the underlying what deacon means. It, it's someone who's busily engaged in service. Well, what kind of service then do deacons engage in? Well, that's a really good question. And it's one that I think that many churches tend to get wrong uh, because there's really, in the, in the Scriptures, two types of service that are spelled out in the Bible. You have what's called practical service, and you have theological service. Practical service is the easiest one to understand. It is where people meet practical needs, like feeding the hungry, mowing the lawn, fixing the buildings. It's, you know, it's making sure that, pe- that members of the church have their physical needs met. It's checking up on people. It's helping them to move. It's lending a hand when it's needed. Practical service is just that. It's really practical. On the other hand, you have theological service. Right? This is where, people, where people's theological needs are met. Right? This includes the preaching of the word, uh, leading worship, teaching, counseling. It also includes things like correcting and rebuking and exhorting and training people up in the word of God. Functionally speaking, the church ministers to the members of its of the church in really two basic ways: by meeting practical needs or meeting theological needs. In fact, the easiest way to understand this is one feeds the body, the other one feeds the soul. That's the, the functional difference between the two. Well, where do the, where do deacons fall into this? Well, let's look at the scriptures. In Acts chapter six, we see the beginning of the first deacons, where the, the office of deacon is created. It reads, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And so what's happening here is the physical needs of the early church were apparent like they are today. Right? People come to church because sometimes they're in need. Right? Well, the the Hellenists, or the, or the Greeks, were complaining against the Hebrews or the Jews because the, the Greek women were not being taken care of. Their needs are not being met like the Jewish women were. And so there arose a disruption in the church. There arose a controversy. And the twelve, which is the apostles, summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up the preaching of the word to serve tables. It's not right for us to give up theological service that we do for practical service. They say, therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And they set before the apostles, these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid hands on them. In this text, what we see is the origin of the office of deacon. And it was an office born out of the fact that the practical needs of the church became so great that they were interfering with the theological needs of the church. And so the apostles made it clear that ministering the word and meeting those theological needs was super important, right? But, but they didn't have time to do that and also meet practical needs. And so they commissioned seven faithful, godly men for this task. And so the office of deacon was born. Deacons are a super important role in leadership role in the church. And what they exercise is practical leadership. Their role is to meet the physical and practical needs of the members of the church and the, and the leaders of the church. That's what they do. They solve problems. They fix things. They help to connect people with resources. And this is such an important role in, 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 the, in the church that the Bible specifies a high set of standards for deacons. That there's a high moral standard for them. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, we read those. And Paul says to Timothy, Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. 
Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, a one-woman man, managing their children and, and their household well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith in, that is in Christ Jesus. And the qualifications of deacons is to be a person of character, a person who is faithful, and a person who is able to lead. And they are tasked then with the practical leadership of the church. They are to meet the physical and practical needs of other people in the congregation. And this is a super important function in the church itself. Now, with that, on the other hand, we have the office of the elder. And, and, and as we have said before, deacons are leading servants, while elders are servant leaders. Deacons serve through practical leadership. Elders ser- serve through theological leadership. Elders are responsible for the spiritual care and the theological direction of the church and his members. Now, the word elder here is, is one, of the, one it's kind of like an odd expression for most of us. Because we tend not to hear a lot about elders in Baptist circles. It's just not something you say. You always say pastors. You don't really say elders. right? In fact, we don't say much about elders in, in America. We think of elders as, as in some kind of like ancient cultural thing. In fact, many people tend to confuse the word elder for deacon as if they're the same office. I know that when I was a newer Christian, I would just use those words interchangeably, deacons and elders, as if they were the same thing. But they are not the same thing. The word elder is from the Greek word presbuteros which is actually the root of where we get our word Presbyterian from. That's where the Presbyterian church gets its name. It literally means elders. Now, with that, the office of the elder is the office of theological leadership in the church. It is the teaching office of the church. As Titus says, an elder must hold firm to the truth as the, truth, the trustworthy word is taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. The elder position is one of teaching and preaching and instruction. It is a theological leadership position. Now, of, of the office of elder, what we find is that it's referred to in the New Testament by different names. It's referred to as an overseer. We see that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, where Paul says, the saying is trustworthy. If one, if one aspires to be an office, to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Elders are called overseers. In the King James Version of the Bible, they call them bishops, right, instead of overseer. When you hear that word bishop, what that simply means is elder or overseer. It's also referred to as pastor or shepherd, in fact, that's what we're most commonly aware of. That's what we commonly think of when we think of the, the office of, of, of elder or the teaching office. In Ephesians chapter 4, we, re- we read that God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, teachers to the church, more specifically the shepherd teachers or pastors. You see, the office of elder or the office of pastor is, is really the one of, of theological leadership, as a, and a pastor or elder's primary job then is what? Ministering the word of God. Preaching, teaching, exhorting, correcting, rebuking, edifying, equipping, praying. In fact, Paul says that God gave pastors to the church for a specific reason. He says to equip the saints or the believers of the church for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure and the stature of fullness of Christ. The pastor's or elder's job is to equip the body of Christ for the work of the ministry so that it all grows towards unity, so that it all grows towards a knowledge of Christ and becomes mature in the faith. The elder's job is to use the word of God to shepherd the congregation, and lead it towards spiritual maturity so that each member of the body, in some capacity, comes to help the church accomplish its mission. That is what pastors and elders are to do. It is the pastor's job to lead and guide the church through the careful exposition of the text 
to become what God is calling the church to become and to do what God's calling the church to do. That is what pastors are for. That's what elders are for. Deacons meet the church's practical and physical needs. Elders or pastors meet the church's theological or spiritual needs. Now, an important thing for us to, to think about is then how does this leadership work itself out in the overall church? How is that leadership to be structured? I mean, we know that deacons lead in practical ways and elders in theological ways, and then everybody else leads in their own ways in, in the way that they minister. How does this all come together? How is the overall leadership of the church to be orchestrated in a way that, that achieves what God is, 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 is aiming at? Well, the first thing that we have to get out of the way, and we have to just be really, really clear about, is the understanding that Jesus ultimately is the leader of the church. He is our head leader. There is no one beyond him. In fact, as Baptists, we believe in the autonomy of the local church, which means we do not have a church authority over us besides Christ. We don't report to area managers. We don't send money to some denominational organization. We don't, lead, we don't, we don't have any leadership structure outside of us that we are accountable to uh, besides Christ himself. We're a congregational church, with a sense, which in a sense means we're self-governing under the leadership of Christ himself. Whereas like denominations like the Assemblies of God or the Presbyterians or the Lutherans or Methodists, they are all part of some larger organization. They, they have each local church reports to a larger organization. As Baptists, we don't see a biblical warrant for that. We are self-governing under the direct leadership of Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, within this, the Word of God, as our final authority on all matters of faith and practice. And our doctrine as a church is how we teach and maintain what we believe. And our statement of faith is a clear dividing line of what we believe and what we don't believe. And these things then come together to give us direction and how we are to order the church and to live and operate as the church. Now, but that still doesn't answer the question of really like how the leadership itself is to be structured. Well, the reality is the overall human leadership of the church outside of Christ should be, biblically speaking, invested in the elders. And the reason is very simple. Jesus is the leader of the church, he guides the church through the written word of God, right, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then it is the business of the elders to study and exegete and interpret the word of God. Right? Now, hear me. Every single one of you should study the word of God. Every single one of you, I think, has a responsibility to know the word of God <clears throat> the best of your ability. But elders are called by God for this particular work. They're gifted for this particular work. They read, they pray, they reflect and meditate upon and exegete and exposit the word of the living God. They take what God has to say and they dig into it and then they then come to the congregation and says, this thus saith, saith the Lord. They take the word of God and they rightly handle and divide it and then they proclaim that truth to the congregation about how the church is to be ran, about how the church is to be organized, about how members of the church ought to live and worship as a direct result of that theological work. That is why there's so much emphasis in the New Testament on teaching. That's why the, why the elder position is also known as overseer in Scripture. That is, that is how God is intended for the church to be ran. In fact, notice what Paul says in Titus. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Paul sent Titus to the island of Crete to help the fledgling churches there to get stabilized, and his primary task was what? To appoint elders or overseers of each congregation. You see, what Paul understands is that qualified leaders lead the church through the preaching of the word, and when that happens, members of the church are edified, and they begin to grow towards maturity and godliness, and their transformed lives then become a beacon of hope for the rest of the world to see. In fact, that's what we see in Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to, for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, and live self-right, means self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age, 
waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous, who are zealous for good works. You see, what Paul understands is that qualified elders of the church, when they teach doctrine that's clear, right, this transforms the lives of the members of the church, and that transformation then is visible to the rest of the world because they begin to renounce the ungodliness that they used to walk in and their worldly passions, and they begin to live completely different, transformed lives. Right? And, and, and suddenly this becomes the light that shines in the darkness. This, in effect, is the light of, of the good works that shine in the darkness for other people to see. Biblical elders preaching the word bring transformation to the members of the church, equipping them to do what the church is supposed to do, which is to defend and declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. And with that, I would argue that the chief leadership responsibility of the church resides then in the elders. Now, I want to spend some time talking a few minutes uh, how how many churches tend to manage this, how, how they manage this leadership um, in, in, in the way that it works itself out legally as a, as, a, as a church structure, and then how it actually works in practice. And one of the things that we find is that when it comes to churches, um, when it comes to leadership, we in this country are heavily influenced by American culture. Why? Because we're Americans, right? We love democracy. I do. We love freedom. We love equality. We, 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 we love even capitalism because of all the choices that it affords us. We we, we, we want a voice. We, we all want to vote. Well, our American identity has worked its way actually into our theology as well. For example, there are some independent congregational churches that believe that the best form of church government is a pure democratic view. And, and what that simply means is the church members have a say in everything in the church. They talk about everything. They argue about everything. They vote on everything from who the pastor might be to the Sunday school curriculum, to the color of the paint on the walls, to whether it's one-ply or two-ply toilet paper, to whether or not bills get paid, they talk about and vote on everything. <clears throat> now, the problem with this perspective, besides the fact that it's terribly inefficient and it tends to create quarrels and power struggles, is the fact that it's just not biblical right? at all. There's nowhere in the Bible, you will not find anything in the Bible that suggests that God intended for this for the church to be governed this way by pure democratic rule. It's, it's not in there. It doesn't exist. And so because of that, we ought to reject that model out of hand. And, and by the way, our church rejected that model years ago. It made a decision years ago that that's just not how we are we're to operate. The second American influence view of the church and how it's supposed to be led is the business view. It's the idea that the best model for the church to be structured is a court, like a company where you have the chief executive officer, right, the CEO or the elder, and then you have a board of directors or a board of deacons. And, and the way this works is the elder or the CEO then is charged with casting the vision of the church and then he has day-to-day -day operational control and does what he needs to do to accomplish the mission. But then he answers periodically to the board of, of directors, the board of deacons. And they have the authority then to change his vision, and they have the authority to change the scope of what he does, and they have the authority to, to change his authority and even replace him if they decide they don't like the results. And so in essence, the elder or the pastor cannot do anything without the clear permission of the deacons. Unlike the previous view, it's thoroughly unbiblical. You will not find in the scriptures that as the model for how the church is to be built. It's just not there. There are no examples of this at all. And worse, what it does is it flips upside down God's, God's intended leadership of the church. God wants the church to be led spiritually and theologically, not pragmatically. The Bible makes it clear that the elders lead by preaching and proclaiming the word, and then deacons lead by supporting elders through practical service. That's, that's what we see in, in Acts chapter 6. The mandate was, was the creation of a team of deacons to handle practical matters in order to support the work that the apostles were, were doing. And so the business model doesn't work. And then we have what I call the modified view, which, is the, which by the way, is, is the way that our church is currently organized. You see, what we have is a congregational model of the church, right, where, 
where we're independent and autonomous, but then the, the pastor is the single overseer of the church, and there is a deacon board that meets you know, practical needs in the church, and they serve as as they, they and they, they serve in, in the capacity of uh, of advisory, you know, uh, for the pastor, but they have no authority over the pastor. And the members then of the congregation, though they submit to the spiritual leadership of the pastor and the practical leadership of the deacons, they also have a measure of authority because they vote on certain things like the hiring of pastors or buying property or taking on debt, or the ratification of who gets appointed as deacons, or the acceptance of new members, or the approval of budgets, which is exactly what we're going to talk about next week. And this model has been in place for long before I got here. This is, this is how the church has operated before I got here. I inherited that. And it has served us pretty well to this point. But this model has one gigantic glaring weakness. And this model's weakness is this. There's just too much authority invested in one person, the pastor. Now, I want you to understand, it, makes things, it would make things easier to get things done, but that's just, I don't believe that that's the way that God intended for it to be. There's too much authority given to one person in the way that we do things. Right? And, and, and this is a problem, right? Because what happens then is that one day what happens, something happens to the pastor, we live in a fallen, broken world, right? Things happen to people. Accidents, sicknesses, right? People go crazy. Huh? Pastor might go crazy, right? What happens if something happens to the pastor? You've invested the church's entire theological direction in one person. The church then has to then find and struggle to find another pastor, which there are members of this church that know what that's like and how much trouble that was. And the problem with that is what happens when you find someone that you think is going to do a good job as a pastor, but then you discover that they're just not really where you are theologically. Maybe they're a little softer on some things. The problem with this current model is you hire a pastor, the pastor pretty much gets to run things how he wants to regardless of how people feel about it. The only way to get rid of him is if he violates the bylaws or the statement of faith. Otherwise, there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing. Except come or not come. Now understand... My attitude has been, from the very beginning, is, to, to, be, is to, to get the deacons and the church leadership on board with any decision we make. My attitude has been is to talk and talk and talk and talk and have meetings and make sure that we're all on the same page and that we're all going forward together you know, in the same direction. I, I do my best to build consensus, and I think it should be that way. But the way our current model is structured, we as a church are vulnerable in the event that we end up needing someday another pastor. This, by the way, is why our church at times in the past has shifted back and forth theologically. With new leaders comes a change in direction. Now, there's always going to be some kind of change when leadership steps up. But you don't want your theology of the church to change. Well, I mean, I don't personally want that for First Baptist Church. I want First Baptist Church to continue to be a strong, conservative church with a high view of God, a high view of Scripture, and a passion to share Christ with the world for long into the future. I mean, we're a church that's 86 years old, and I would like for First Baptist Church to continue on another 100 years or more if that's how long the Lord decides to wait to come back. Right? I believe with all my heart that for that to happen, then we need to really reevaluate and, and, and change our church government to fit a little more closely to what the Bible actually teaches. You see, there's, there's a component that's missing here. And I believe it's in the scriptures. So turn with me again to Titus chapter 1. I want you to notice something here. It's really kind of like easy to skip over. Paul says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Now most people focus on the qualifications of elders right after this phrase, but they miss the obvious point that Paul makes. Notice he says, elders, not elder. Not one pastor, but elders, plural. More than one. In fact, 
Whenever you read the scriptures, I don't know if you ever noticed, but when you ever read the scriptures and they ever talk about the leadership of the church, they always refer to elders, plural, never a single elder. They never talk about a church being led by one particular elder. The biblical model of the church is to have multiple or plural elders. This is how God has designed the church. He designed the church to be led not simply by one qualified man who can then go astray, but multiple qualified men. Why? Because it protects the church. It protects the church from from a dynamic personality, from hijacking the direction of the church. Just look around and see how many churches in the world around us have been led astray by high-profile false teachers. And guess what? Those churches can't get rid of those people. They can't. It's in the bylaws. They're stuck with them. Having multiple elders protects the church from this, from, from this and also wild shifts in theology. It also provides consistency in the theological direction of the church. And that's what what the churches need over over the long haul is consistently consistency. It takes a lifetime to teach doctrine. You want your church to continually be doing that over the lifetime of those who attend the church. It also protects the church in the event that someone something happens to the lead pastor. Like I'm as you know, I'm sick today. <clears throat> I didn't have time to, 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 to call someone to fill in for me. I mean, believe me, Hugh would have filled in for me if, if I would have asked him to, and Keith would have. But they would have both been like off the cuff and trying to, to do something last minute. But with the board of elders, there's a little bit more planning and theological direction that they're going together. And so there's a sense of team. And so it's easier for them to phase in and out when, when somebody uh, isn't up to par Right? These men will be qualified to train to do so. Having multiple elders is a great way to protect the integrity of the church. But it also protects the elders. Because the elders have a group of people to be accountable to. to. They have a team. If there is anything in the world that can get somebody in trouble, is, to, for, is for, for elders or pastors in a church to begin to think that they're better than they really are. You see it all the time, right? You see it all the time on on television. Elders and pastors begin to run roughshod over their congregations because they think they're smarter than everybody else and they're better than everybody else and and they're the man of God and blah, 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 blah. We see it all the time. Having a board of elders then levels the playing field because they are all equals then. It's a team of people. And so then they have the ability to teach each other. They have the ability to rebuke each other. They have the ability to correct each other when they're in error. They, they have the ability to help each other grow. Elders hold each other accountable. They keep each other balanced. In fact, they take care of each other's spiritual needs. You see, they have the ability to minister to one another, challenge one another, help each other grow theologically. That's what's missing right now in our individual church. In addition to that, having the church having a church that seeks and trains elders in order to then have this plural eldership or maintain an elder board actually then helps in another way. It helps us to develop future leaders. This is another thing that's missing from our church ministry. This gives us an opportunity to have a program to seek out and invest in and train up biblical qualified leaders. We should be doing that. This should be part of the church's mission. Now, not every elder that gets trained up here and becomes an elder is going to be a paid staff member because there are lay elders and there, then, there, then there are vocational elders. Right? Because, and, and not every elder will act as a senior pastor. Right? But, but, but we must begin training men who can learn how to handle the Word of God rightly, to exegete the text correctly, and then to proclaim the, the Word of God clearly. We need to train men who can then also teach theology classes. We need to train men who can then counsel people because if there's a great need that we have in our church right now is counseling. There are lots of people who require that love and help and that need that theological leadership even in counseling. We need to train up men to be disciple makers. And then we need to give them opportunities to practice these things so that we're raising up our own future leaders. This also then fulfills the Great Commission. Because our church should be training up elders, elder-qualified men who go out and leave this church 
and go start missions and plant churches in other parts of the world. We at First Baptist Church should be raising up young men who are called by God to go out into the world and build more self-replicating churches. By the way, that's the design. That is the, that, that is, that is the mission. The biblical model of the church is to have multiple elders and pastors who are training up more elders and pastors, and they send them out, and they replicate over and over again. That right there, by the way, is the opportunity that we have with the people in Pakistan. Right? Asif is, is basically coming to us to disciple him, to train him, to help him become a biblically qualified elder right, with sound theology that we can then help him then create more elders so they can be a self-sustaining church who then go out and do the same thing and the same thing and the same thing. Now, I realize to this point I've already covered a lot of ground, and I've kind of went fast, but, but bear with me because I also want to share with you a little bit about the qualifications of this, this church leadership. This is important. Okay? Paul says anyone is above reproach, a husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to a charge of debauchery and insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. You see, the leadership qualifications of both Deacons and elders are nearly identical. They have, they have a lot of commonalities. Both deacons and elders are to be known for faithfulness. And that faithfulness is demonstrated by being faithful to, to, that, to his wife. Now, that does not mean that a person who's had a divorce in his history cannot be a deacon or elder. What that means is, do you have a track record, a history of being faithful to the one that you're married to? Can, can your faithfulness be demonstrated by the, by, by the way that you're faithful to your wife? That's the qualification. Secondly, it's demonstrated leadership. And the most important pl- uh, place that a man is to demonstrate his leadership is in his home. Can he lead his family? Thirdly, it must be, they must be strong in the faith. Deacons and elders must be convinced that they are in the kingdom of heaven. The fruit of their life must be bearing testimony of the fact that they have met Jesus and Jesus has transformed them and they live dependent upon his grace. And then finally, they need to be men of integrity. Now, this doesn't mean morally perfect because guess what? Nobody is. But there are to be men who seek to follow God and are growing in obedience and holiness and men who, when they make mistakes, they confess it, repent of it, and then make it right. That's what it means to be a man of integrity. These qualifications go for both elders and deacons. Both the leadership positions require that these men live this high biblical standard. And this is something that the church needs to get right. Now, the primary difference between elders and deacons is one qualification, and it is this, to be able to teach sound doctrine. That's what Paul says. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, Paul says, Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, just like the deacons were, but then to be able to teach. That's the difference. They must be able to teach from the Scriptures the sound doctrine of the faith. They must be able to communicate and teach from the confession of faith. Because that's exactly where elders lead. They lead by teaching doctrine, by, by leading people through the word, by preaching the word, by expositing the, the truth of God's word for the congregation. That is how elders change the world. That is how they change lives. It's through the preaching and teaching of the word. And every church, every church needs more than one elder to do that. We need more elders. We need a board of elders. A group of elders. People who've been trained in the doctrines of the church, people who've been trained in the confession of our faith, and are able to take the word of God and then feed the sheep. Now, there will still be a need for a senior pastor who does the primary teaching, but 
we need a board of elders to provide the right kind of balance for that leadership. That way we don't have too much leadership invested in one person. Now, I, I thank the Lord that this congregation saw fit to make me that person seven years ago. But I walk very, very softly understanding I've been granted more authority than I absolutely really have the right to, I feel. That's why I've been careful to build consensus. But I have been studying this issue for years. I have read books on this for years. And what I find is the biblical model, the Baptist model of plural eldership. And so with that, there's a couple of important things that are going to be coming up. Next week, we're going to have our church business meeting. And uh, that's going to be after the service. And so those of you who are members will have an opportunity to be there and to, to, to voice your opinions um, but in that meeting, I'm going to renominate several deacons who have been serving. I'm also going to nominate some new deacons um, who, who would I like to, to, to invest in to begin to serve. And you guys have an opportunity to chime in and vote on that. Right? That's an important part of the process. Secondly, I'm going to present to you after uh, that, um, is, is a, after all these years, a revision of our church bylaws that really kind of fixes this broken current system. That, that what it does, it'll specify that our church is to be governed by not just one person, but a board of elders. Right? And, and, and it will specify then how those elders are nominated and how the church then ratifies that. And I believe that that ultimately, long term, is the right direction for this church to go. And then... This year, coming up, I'm going to actually put into place a training program. We now finally have the tools to do this with. A training program to train up potential elders. It'll be, you know, it will be a comprehensive education that will cover everything from doctrine and the theology of the church to then exposition of the word and how to actually preach. And the goal is just going to be very simple. is We're going to train more elder qualified men to fulfill the mission of God that he has given us. Right? That, and, so, and, and so that's, I believe, the, the God-given direction that he's, he's given us, is that we have, the, we have the truth right, we'll get our leadership in the church right, and then we'll be able to then fulfill the mission long into the future. Because brothers and sisters, the time is coming that if we don't have these things right, the culture is going to swallow us whole. We already see the beginnings of that. We already see that out in the world already. We already see churches that are being forced to capitulate. The, the Methodist church just split over the LGBT issue. Completely split. They're splitting up into two, another denomination because you have those that stand on the word of God and you have those that, that, that have then failed to get those things, the leadership and the word part right. And so I want you to know the reason why I'm talking about this is because I love this church so much that I want to make sure that long in the future, long after all of us are gone, that there's somebody standing up here that's preaching the word of God and there are people out there growing in their understanding of who Christ is. And so with that then, your homework this week, <laughs> your homework this week is to reread first in 2 Timothy and Titus again. But this time now that, that you've kind of got some familiarity with it, I want you to begin to notice the relationship with teaching and sound doctrine, right? And, and biblical I want you to notice how those things, those two things connect together. So um, let me pray for you. You've been listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a production of First Baptist Church in Boron, California. Our website address is fbcboron.org. And would you please consider partnering with us financially as we work to share the hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and our world.